The Dutch became interested in flowers largely because they lived in quite a drought country. The weather, this is the time of the Little Ice Age, the weather was quite poor, quite cold, uh, and the whole country was um, on the edge of a large, large expanse of fairly drab sea. A lot of it was, had just been reclaimed from the sea. Uh, and there was very little in the way of sort of colour or natural beauty about it. One of the Englishmen who visited Holland at this time described it as a universal quagmire, the buttock of the world. So the interest in flowers largely came from a desire to beautify these rather drab surroundings. And there was a fashion in Holland from the beginning of the 1600s for growing fairly formal, fairly beautiful flower gardens to try to offset this, uh, the, the, the lack of beauty that nature had provided the country with. The most important thing to remember about the Netherlands in the early 17th century was that it was in fact the first modern economy. Uh, it was by far the wealthiest part of Western Europe and that wealth was based on long distance trade. The Dutch had acquired a monopoly of the spice trade with the East Indies, which had taken from the Portuguese by force. Um, and they were importing large quantities of peppers, cloves, nutmeg, cinnamon, all of the spices which were in high demand throughout Europe. And the reason for that demand was largely because in the era before the invention of refrigeration, meat which you bought from a butcher's store, from a market, would tend to be going off by the time you ate it. So spices were in high demand to, to disguise the taste of rotting meat. And the Dutch controlled that trade. And as a result, a large number of Dutchmen became extremely wealthy from the long distance spice trade with the East Indies. If you look at the reasons why the tulip bulb became so highly valued in the Netherlands in the early 17th century, you need to consider a couple of key factors. The first thing was the religion of the country. It's a Calvinist society. There was a strong prescription against any sort of ostentation or you know, expensive jewellery, um, displays of wealth. The one exception to this was things that were natural, things that had been created by God. They thought that because the, the tulip was a beautiful flower, which was a creation of God, it was perfectly all right to display it and grow it because it was a, a way of worshipping God, in fact, to, to have these very elaborate displays of flowers which they put into their formal gardens. The second reason was that the tulip was actually a very new innovation, a very new flower. It hadn't been known in the West for very long. It had come into Europe from Ottoman Empire, from Turkey, only in the middle of the previous century. And um, the tulip bulb, as was known then, was also very difficult to propagate. One of the side effects of the Netherlands being a modern economy was that they had developed what we now know as the futures trade. What this means is that you can effectively take a gamble on the arrival of a cargo, in their case from the East Indies. You'll be able to buy a share in the cargo or the whole cargo for a certain guaranteed price. And so you were effectively taking a gamble on whether the price would go up or down between the time when you purchased your share in the cargo and it actually arrived in the Netherlands. But this acted essentially as a way of, for the rich merchants of keeping control of the prices and avoiding exposure to too much sudden demand or loss of demand. Now, this idea was taken by the earliest tulip traders and used to develop the trade. And the way in which it worked was quite important because essentially what it meant was you only put down a deposit on the tulip bulb that you were going to buy. And as a result, you could afford to buy many more because you'd pay, your deposit would normally be about 10% of the full value of the bulb. And the rest would be payable when the bulb was lifted from the ground. So Around about the year 1634, the tulip trade began to change. Essentially what happened was that word of the high prices being paid by rich connoisseurs, the rich merchants for tulip bulbs, began to circulate in Holland. And this began to attract other people who saw that prices had risen and were continuing to rise consistently. Now the interesting thing about this is that the very, the very valuable bulbs that the connoisseurs traded were the ones that were least accessible to the tulip traders because they existed in such small quantities. And so effectively an artificial trade began, and this is crucial to understanding why trade collapsed as rapidly as it did. Outside that very small number of very superbly fine tulips, there was only a small number of people who actually wanted to, to, to buy and grow tulips for their own value. What tended to happen was that tulips then became traded purely as a commodity, as a speculation. People thought that they could buy and sell them and make money by selling on the risk and making a profit, not as something which they would actually end up planting and growing and selling physical flowers. 
um, the word of the collapse in prices, which took place on the 5th of February 1637, travelled first of all from tavern to tavern in Harlem, and then somebody went on a horse to Amsterdam, informed the traders there, and gradually over a period of maybe almost a week, it spread across the towns of the Netherlands. And each time the news got to a town where there was a group of tulip traders, the effect was, of course, to create an immediate panic and a, a consequent collapse of prices in that town. And so over the course of a week, prices went down by around about 99% in all of the major towns in the Netherlands, with the effect that a very large number of people who had been involved in the tulip trade lost effectively all the money that they had and found themselves, in addition, with gigantic liabilities for the tulips which they still owned. What happened was a sort of quick pass the parcel sort of effect where the Dutch authorities in various towns tried to shift the responsibility for settling these problems back up to the, uh, the Estates General, which is the name given to the Dutch Parliament. And the Dutch Parliament took one look at this and said, we don't want to have any involvement in this either, and insisted that the towns took part in the, uh, the settlement. So what you actually ended up with was a situation where each individual town had quite a different policy for settling this. The one which was probably the most successful was actually uh, in Harlem, where the authorities refused to allow anybody to take part in a legal action involving a, a tulip bulb. And this had the effect essentially of cancelling all the debts which existed. And, and most people probably came out of that more or less even because the great chain of ownership of all the different bulbs sort of cancelled each other out. Some people owed money and were owed money. And by cancelling all of these debts, they, they were left more or less where they started from. There were a few examples of people who did suffer quite extensively from the collapse of the tulip trade and probably the best known example is a painter named Jan van Goyen, who was quite a well-known painter of landscapes in the Netherlands at this time. He'd actually given up being an artist in order to become a professional trader in tulip bulbs and he had the misfortune to live in one of the few towns where it was allowed to bring legal cases against people who owed money on the tulip trade. As a result, well, he was sued for about 820 guilders, and that's, this is at a time when about 300 guilders was the typical income of a middle-class Dutch family for a whole year. So it was a pretty large amount of money. And the consequence of this for Van Gogh was that he had to go back to being a painter. And as a result, we actually have 40 or 50 more canvases of his that we would otherwise have, uh, which he painted over the rest of his life in a futile attempt to discharge his debt. And in fact, when he died, he was still in debt to the tune of almost 800 guilders. The memory of the tulip trade was kept alive in the Netherlands. Uh, one of the immediate consequences of the mania was the publication of a large number of moralistic religious pamphlets that decried the whole idea of trying to get rich quick, essentially. Um, and the dramatic nature of, of the collapse of the bubble was also quite easy to remember. It's pretty obvious that there are clear parallels between the tulip mania of the 17th century and the economic crisis that we're facing today. Most obviously, the lesson that one learns from this is that people who are inside a financial bubble never seem to realise that this is the case. They always assume they can rationalise that prices will continue to go up for some reason or other. And the collapse of the bubble, which to those looking back suddenly appears to be quite inevitable, does not seem to be inevitable until the moment that the collapse happens. It is pretty clear that a large portion of the blame for the tulip mania and indeed for other financial crises is caused by greed. Essentially what happens is that people who have very little experience of trading and who have very little capital get sucked into a trading boom by the desire to get rich quick. And these are the people who are least well adapted to dealing with a crisis when it happens. They don't have the resources, they don't have the experience to know what to do either. Um, and so they are the ones who usually come out worst and are most badly burned by the whole experience.